Imagine this. You're at a party at a friend's house and you meet new people. What is the first thing they ask you? Hi, I'm so-and-so, what's your name, right? Yeah. In my case, when I find myself in a Dutch-speaking environment, I'm okay. In an English crowd, like here, my name usually gets turned into a famous Dutch beer. But let's say I survived the first question all right. What is the next thing people almost always ask? What do you do? So, Rineke, what do you do? And that's when the trouble begins for me. I try to explain in a single sentence what it is I do. I lead Radio Zamane, independent media organization for Iran. When I'm very unlucky, I then have to explain that that's in Persian and not in Arabic, and that Farsi and Persian are the same thing, that Farsi is the word in Persian for Persian. Um, and then a whole new set of predictable responses start. And I'm sure many of you here are familiar with some of these. Number one. Ah, Iran, yes, I used to have an Iranian neighbor or colleague or dentist. Number two. So, you must travel to Iran often. No, I don't. Number three. Now, with the nuclear deal, everything's solved, right? Well, after today, I think you know that that's not the case either. And then number four, and I get this one a lot, is, hypothetically speaking, if Iran were a free country and you wouldn't have to operate from exile, then basically you'd be without a job. There would be no more need for Zamane. Now, that's when I object. That's when I say it is our dream to operate from inside Iran. Here we go. It's our dream to help build a strong civil society, democratic culture, and press freedom in Iran. Now, I know I don't have to talk to you about the importance of access to information and freedom of expression, but I do want to talk to you about the importance of independent quality journalism and the irreplaceable role and function it has in any society anywhere in the world, but most certainly in Iran. In this talk, I want to show you that it is important that we keep on supporting good journalism practice by giving you an example of what can happen when slogans take over and by showing you some of the reporting that Samana has been doing this last year. A lot has changed in media and journalism and quality journalism is suffering. We've all seen a shift from offline to online, from traditional newspapers to new media, we experience a massive overload of content and information flooding our systems every single minute of every day through social media. Um, in the US, it showed that among the adults, 62% gets their news through social media. Yet, only 4% trusts the information that they get through social media. This is not surprising because research has also shown that because of the internet and social media, false information has become much more accessible, much more visible, and it's harder to distinguish from facts. Words like fact-free politics, post-factual democracy in a fact-free era are going around in media trying to give a name to this new phenomenon. Now, fact-checking can slow down the process and spread of misinformation. And thankfully, there's been a huge increase in fact-checking websites, an estimated 60% between 2015 and 2016. Yet, the effects are debatable. The most prominent award-winning fact-checking website, PolitiFact, they say themselves that apart from a small group of political diehards, not many people pay attention to it. Also, once attractive, sensational misinformation is going around online, it's very difficult to stop it. In addition, social media are designed to just give you more of what you've already clicked on. Now, don't get me wrong, I love social media. I am addicted to Facebook, I'm a slave to my smartphone. I love how it makes the world smaller, how it helps me connect to people, how it helps me find and share the things that are important to me. Also, I think that these changes in media caused by rapid technological advances are a good thing in many regards. Because it's forced these rigid traditional systems to move and to develop. Media must innovate, experiment, and we need to find new ways of storytelling. 
But alongside the interesting roads of exploration, one super important thing is jeopardized. A great good that has become subservient to the number of likes and clicks and shares. Quality journalism. Quality journalism. Social media do not produce news. It does not report facts. It does not ask critical questions. Journalists do. Journalists who deserve to be paid for their services. Now, whether that is done by civil society in the form of citizen reporting or by people that have a degree in journalism, in my opinion, doesn't matter. What matters is that we, as citizens, are presented with facts. That we gain new knowledge by offering insights, analysis and reflection. That it helps us grasp complex issues through great storytelling. That it opens up our eyes to taboos in society around us and that it empowers people to hold those in power accountable. Now, an example of what can happen when slogans take over, an example that's often featured in discussions around this new thing called the fact-free era, is a great example, unfortunately, of the impact it can have on people's lives, the Brexit. The UK voting to leave the European Union. This example is the one I want to share with you today. This is what the Leave campaign communicated. We sent 350 million pounds a week to the EU, which we could also use to uh, fund our national health system with. Fact of the matter is that not even half of that goes to the EU, if you consider what comes back through funding from the EU, and that's also the estimated amount that's probably needed to access the common market post-Brexit. Yet, this is what the newspapers reported. The Sun being the number one best-selling paper in the UK, generally followed by people not all that interested in politics. And um, the Daily Mail is the second best-selling paper in the UK. Then this happens. People vote leave. The Brexit is a fact. Followed by the leaders of the Leave campaign, Farage and Johnson, quit. Meanwhile, British people go online to independently look for facts and information about what this really means. What is the EU? What is the Brexit? After they voted. Then, this woman becomes Prime Minister. But she was never elected by the people. She was never elected Prime Minister, yet she now gets to run the country. And she just so happened, by the way, to decide to close the Department of Climate Change during her first week on the job. So, the British people have based their behavior mostly on slogans rather than on facts, and it has far-reaching consequences for their country and for their lives. You may argue that the direct role that media has had in this should be nuanced, but I think it is clear that media has had a stake in this, at least, and that they have a responsibility to question politicians and to independently report to the people on issues as important as this. On the imposing side, thankfully, there are plenty of amazing examples where we can see the impact of good journalism practice where movements and new groups, they come together from a strong vision and mission to use journalism for the social good. For instance, Bellingcat, a citizen reporting investigative group that uses open source data to investigate cases such as the downing of MH17 with compelling results. Or Follow the Money, a Dutch initiative, a movement of highly qualified investigative journalists that work up to three years on cases to investigate and to expose large-scale financial corruption here in the Netherlands. Now, these and many other examples, they illustrate what different shapes and forms the process of journalism and storytelling can take. While we're feeling facts that were unknown to the people, but they can seriously impact their lives. This is also what we hope to achieve at Samane, and for which we have created our own unique media model. 
We believe in a strong community and high participatory levels of news gathering and sharing. Over the years, we've moved from a top-down information dissemination into the circular model, where we combine these three platforms and where they strengthen each other. Professional journalism through Radio Zamane, education through Zamane Academy, and citizen reporting on Zamane Tribune, which is also used by civil society organizations to, um, uh, to advocate for their causes. Now, these platforms are all accessible to people inside Iran through circumvention technologies, such as the amazing award-winning tool Siphon. You got to meet them today here in the other room. Um, and these platforms, they all feed into and off each other. And so this enables us to tell a story completely and in many different ways, making sure that we can uh, offer access to information uh, to people wherever and however they choose to connect. In order to better reflect these activities, I'm very happy that I can finally, officially, present to you the new name under which we will be operating. Zamane Media Foundation. <laughs> this new model that I just showed to you it has allowed Samane to increase its reach and access into all regions of Iran, even the very underexposed and remote areas. For instance, through our weekly field reports, brought to us by our field reporters that were sometimes educated in Zamane Academy or that started blogging on Zamane Tribune and got noticed. These local reporters, they help us tell the stories of real people. Because in addition to covering news on macropolitics, we care about people caught in macropolitics. We want to tell their stories. We want to give a face to issues that affect Iranians' everyday lives. We consider Zamane, therefore, the media of the margins. We want to cover stories that remain hidden, that have taboos, that have minorities and peripheries away from the power of, uh, the, from the center of power. Therefore, the mission that was founded in August of 2006 is still very much alive today. To be a voice to the voiceless. From 10,000 stories that we publish on Zamane Media every single year, it's very difficult to make a selection, as you can imagine. But I've chosen four examples to just give you an idea and a glimpse into what it is that we do. Remember I said we care about personal stories? Well, on our human rights section, we try to give a human face to the inhumane treatment of political prisoners by building an Evin memorial. The most notorious Evin prison in Tehran, from the time of the Shah, the revolution, the 80s, the Green Movement, and still today, holds many political prisoners and human rights are grossly violated. Where the governor announced plans to turn the prison into a recreational center, as you are aware of, Zamane is lending media support to Evin prisoners, former and present, their families and their friends, to build a monument in remembrance of their experiences. The Evin Memorial Campaign is an initiative to collect these memories. I want to read a short piece of the announcement that was published by our editors. Our dream, the dream of those who were tortured in Evin, who passed their lives there in envy of freedom, or who had our loved ones subjected to torture there, was to see Evin turned into a museum with input from prisoners who languished there under either regime. Now they plan to erase the very image of Evin from history in order to replace it with a recreational center. Let us raise our voices in protest. We are calling on all those who have served time in Evin or had their loved ones imprisoned or executed in Evin. Let us recount our stories of those experiences. Come, let us build a memorial with our memories. Our voices will endure. Our words will become eternal. We published over 40 personal stories written up by ex-political prisoners. 
This memorial is important to us because it sheds light not only on human rights abuses, but we want to make sure that this part of Iran's contemporary history is not swept under the rug. And we hope that through this memorial, we can empower and give ammunition to activists that fight for the release of people's unjust imprisonment today. After this, I think we need an uplifting story. I have one for you. My next example. Lake Bazanga in northeast Iran. This was one of the stories that came to us through a field reporter. Samana is one of the few media that's able to provide scientifically sound publications on the environment. But we don't only want to focus on issues, we want to focus on solutions as well. You might not know that forced migration because of climate change and water shortage is already happening in Iran. So we hope to raise awareness on these issues, that people understand what it means for their lives. But as I said, we also want to show solutions and best practice examples. So this is a story of Lake Bazangan and four different villages. Um, their livelihoods depend on this lake. But the lake is drying up. There's no help from government, and there's no international aid organization coming in to help them. So they took matters into their own hands. When the rainfall came, they started using their shovels and their machineries to ditch these dredges and, and channels into the springs that feed the lake in order to save it. Now, isn't this an inspiring story? Through this publication, we can show that truly community-driven action can help, and that it can be an example to other communities that struggle with the same issues. Zamanes culture, arts, and literature section last year alone published uh, uh, works from over 100 young artists, poets, and creative writers from inside Iran, including a lot of women. Majority of them were women. This is Frida Narin. She sent, us her, uh, sent us her autobiographical short story on what it was like for her to experience an abortion in Iran. She had no idea her story would be among the top 10 creative writers selected by a panel of professional authors. Authors who choose to publish at Samana because we've been able to provide a safe space for underground artists in Iran. Abortion is a taboo topic. But through creative writing and a story like Frida's, this provides us the opportunity to make such stories accessible in a way that's not threatening, and that can help make these topics discussable. Then finally, politics. Complicated business in Iran. But on topics related to Iranian politics, we've been actively shaping the larger debate. Last year, our resourceful political analysts were able to discuss debates on the succession to the seat of the Supreme Leader Khamenei. Current signs suggest the fight of succession will be fierce and intense. And Zamanai was able to make this a central debate, highlighting the thought and predictions of many prominent political analysts. Connected to this debate are issues of economic corruption, democratic transparency and accountability. And these are all, as you know, important issues for Iran to talk about, but also especially with upcoming elections. So, we believe that through strong analytical reporting, by covering the story behind the news, and promoting and strengthening independent critical thinking, we can make a difference. With a steady, loyal, and active audience base of over 14 million visits per year, we've even become an example to other exiled media working on different regions in different countries by providing them with training and consultancy. Zamana has become an organization where we all work hard and professionally towards the same goal. And I believe we do that with a lot of respect and appreciation for each other. And with a lot of love. <laughs> as you can see from our internal communication that I desperately wanted to share with you because it wasn't rigged by me. This is real. 
I think that if you believe in a purpose so strongly, you feel it and you see it. I'm very happy to be part of this and to be able to lead Samane's first step, steps into new exciting decades. Without naming names, I want to say thank you to everyone that has contributed to, has been part of this journey. I hope you have seen that uh, Zaman is something special and that you've seen some of its magic today. In this new age where media are financially suffering and good journalism is declining, we need this community to keep it alive and to make sure that we can continue on doing what we do best, telling stories. If you like us, please support us. For instance, by filling in a donation form that's here on your seat, or by doing that online on our donation page. I hope to see you all again, offline or online, maybe at our next event, maybe 10 years down the road at the next anniversary. Maybe, who knows, at a party in Tehran, where I hope someone will ask me, Rineke, what do you do? Thank you so much. <laughs>